evening as we tackle John 7, 37 through 39 in our text this evening. And uh, I just want to thank you for your presence here that testifies that all that thrills your soul is Jesus. Honestly, there's no other reason to come out to Kwamba on Super Bowl Sunday than if your soul is thrilled with Jesus. So I trust that the Lord Jesus will thrill our souls this evening. We are going to be looking at some incredible words that he said. And this is our text, beginning in verse 37 of John 7. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, From his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Let's pray and jump in. Father, thank you for granting us the opportunity to ponder these three highly significant and yet admittedly difficult verses. We pray that the wonderful message of the Lord Jesus would sink deep into our hearts, that we would indeed be thrilled by this tremendous promise of our Lord Jesus to satisfy the thirsty. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, up so far in chapter 7, we follow Jesus from beginning with this interaction with his unbelieving brothers who tried to convince him to make this dramatic entry into the Feast of Jerusalem uh, by working mighty signs. Then Jesus makes a rather quiet and even secretive and late arrival to the Feast of Booths in Jerusalem. And John has told us that Jesus was teaching... But up to this point, the only things that we have recorded of what Jesus said was interactions with people who are questioning his Messiahship. Now here in verse 37, Jesus speaks in a teaching or preaching sort of fashion. Finally, we can be certain that Jesus said more than what John recorded, but the two little sentences that John does record are rich, full, and as we've already said, difficult to interpret. Anybody who thinks or says that Jesus spoke very simply and clearly and Jesus told a ton of stories so that, Jesus, so that nobody could ever misunderstand what he said is frankly kind of ignorant of the way Jesus taught. In John's Gospel in particular, Jesus is misunderstood all over the place and we're far more likely to find John explaining Jesus than Jesus actually going back and explaining himself. And we actually have that case in point here. These verses are difficult enough to understand that even scholars will debate the punctuation, not to mention the imagery behind what Jesus uses. Maybe we'll get to that. But what we have here in verse 39 is very... We have deep gratitude to John for giving us this little editorial comment from the pen of the Apostle that gives us sort of a lever, if you will, to try to pry open this chest of riches that fall from Jesus' lips in just a couple of short phrases. Let me give you the premise of our study here tonight. And that is simply this. We don't place a high enough value on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We don't well understand the ministry of the Spirit. It's clouded by all sorts of weirdness that you find in various charismatic circles. And frankly, the ministry of the Spirit within a believer isn't often a part of our appeal in evangelism. The the indwelling Spirit is sort of a secondary thing that we'll explain to a new convert once, once the Spirit takes up residence, but... If you will, we don't really advertise the indwelling spirit like we would set forth to an unbeliever the the blessings of eternal life and forgiveness of sin. 
the glories of being justified, uh, the happiness of heaven, and the escape from hell. Those are kind of the primary things that we use in evangelism. But Jesus is here evangelizing, and he's inviting people to come to him. You see this, if anyone is thirsty. This is an invitation, if you will, for those to come to him so they, they could receive the indwelling spirit from him. And so the, the offer of the Holy Spirit is a major point of attraction, if you will, to the Lord Jesus. I want you to notice Jesus' courage as the text opens. It says, Jesus stood and cried out. Uh, the Greek verb for cry out here is kradzo, if I remember right, and it stands, it, it, it means to cry out, to yell loudly, and this is what Jesus does outside the tomb of Lazarus, it's what every mother does when it's lunchtime, cry out, hey, come and get it. This stands, this verb cry out, stands, I think, in notable and noticeable opposition to the cowardly Pharisees we looked at who are hiding somewhere trying to pull strings from their secrecy. We'll dig them up in their back room somewhere in verse 45. We even have the intimidated crowds who John says more than once are, are sort of speaking to each other in whispers because they're afraid of the Pharisees. Furthermore, a rabbi would typically teach sitting down. Jesus teaches that way in Luke 4, sitting down. Jesus' enemies are so hostile they want to assassinate him. The hostility is so great that Jesus came to the feast, as it were, in secret. But his secrecy is no more. That's all gone. In fact, doesn't this statement of Jesus feel more like a major proclamation than just quiet instruction? Jesus isn't expounding on some minor detail of the law. He is, if you will, taking on the mantle of a, of a herald and trying to reach as many ears as possible with this massive pronouncement among a massive crowd. So Jesus, I just want you to think about the wisdom of Jesus and the courage of Jesus, which really we find hand in hand in John 7. And Jesus knows when to fly under the radar, if you will. You see that in verse 1. Jesus isn't walking in Galilee because they're seeking to kill him in Judea. And so he knows when to stay low, and he knows when to draw all eyes to himself. He came to the feast in secrecy, but he ends it with an intentional attempt, effort, to bring all eyes to himself. We saw last week that Jesus exposed his enemies as great colossal cowards, and frankly, he has nothing to fear from them at this point. But of course, Jesus doesn't fear anything. You can't read fear into verse 1 when it says Jesus was unwilling to walk in Judea. It doesn't mean he was afraid to. We just understand that verse is Jesus being discreet and Jesus understanding of the Father's good providence directing his steps. And in the same way, we don't understand Jesus standing up and crying out as uh, tr Jesus trying to test the Father's care for him. See if you can protect me from this, Father. I'm going to tell him exactly where I am. The fact of the matter is sin destroys the simplicity of life and it introduces a ridiculous complexity to life. Some of you perhaps come from a very broken family and trying to explain your relationships uh, to uh, others when you have different parents and, and there's more divorce and intermarriage and all sorts of weird stuff. Uh, life gets really complex because of sin. And, and Christians in the face of hostility run into something of that complexity. Like Jesus, when the, when the waters are hot, sometimes we have to steer clear of them, and sometimes we just jump right in. So sometimes Paul goes to Jerusalem, knowing full well he's going to be arrested and against the advice of all his friends. And sometimes Jesus, or sometimes Paul is lowered over the wall in a basket and escapes the trouble. Sometimes Jesus goes to Jerusalem in secret, verse 1. And sometimes Jesus stands and cries out so everybody can see him. Verse 37. We really need wisdom in days of hostility, which are fast approaching and are here in some measure. We need the wisdom of the Lord Jesus. 
And we need to make our plans in the face of hostility, set our direction, not on the basis of fear, but understanding the providence of God. The fear of man cannot drive us. We must not let it drive us. We must fear God. The great Puritan Matthew Henry said, Gospel truth seeks no corners because it fears no trials. I like that. But let's now get to the heart of the matter. What is it that Jesus actually says when he stands up? Jesus says, verse 37, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. As we try to understand this text, the first question we have to simply ask is, if anyone is thirsty for what? What sort of thirst is Jesus looking for here? The Jewish people were thirsty for political and military dominance. The Pharisees were thirsty for the glory of man. We see that in 544, John 12, 45 and 46. Some people thirst for earthly pleasures. Some people thirst for riches. So many in our age thirst for physical health and beauty. We're reminded, I was reminded this past election cycle of how many Christians thirst most for a moral, prosperous nation full of social justice and a Christianized culture. Frankly, we have no reason to expect that Jesus is speaking to these people. I think to, to people who have these other sorts of thirsts, Jesus might say, you will seek me and will not find me, and where I'm going you cannot come. That is to say, Jesus might say, I didn't come to fulfill these longings. Even the thirst for Jesus itself, a proper thirst, is a glory, is a gift of God. Any sort of thirst is a, is a gift of God, which, like most of God's good gifts, are often twisted, they're distorted, and ultimately destructive. All people thirst, but not everyone thirsts for God. Most, to use Paul's Roman 1 language, exchange the truth of God for a lie. And they thirst after the creature instead of the creator. Paul will even say that some are greedy in their pursuit of fleshly desires. So it's important that we understand that Jesus didn't come to fulfill whatever particular thirst you might have. But there is clearly here a thirst that he loves to not only satisfy, but satisfy in a permanent sense by offering a drink that once you drink it becomes an ever-running fountain. It's an artesian well, if you will. It's a well within the one who drinks. So that water, verse 38, comes gushing out for all eternity. But not everyone has that thirst. So what is, what is the answer? If anyone is thirsty for what, Jesus? Probably the simplest and most obvious answer would be God. Those who thirst for God will find him in Jesus. Those who thirst for God find that Jesus is God, find that Jesus is the way to God. Those who thirst for God will find that Jesus is the mediator who makes our access to the Father possible. He makes it actually possible for us to be satisfied in God. And we can find support for this in Psalm 42. As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, O God. Psalm 143, 6. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul longs for you as in a parched land. I think it's blasphemous to speak of a God-shaped hole in our heart, if only because thinking of God as having some sort of shape makes me really uneasy. And I don't like the idea that our soul is so big it has a hole in which God can fit in it. And that kind of makes me bigger than God. But I do understand the sort of sentiment behind the phrase. I think it's just a really lousy attempt to modernize Augustine's famous line, Thou hast made us for thyself, and our souls are restless until they find their rest in thee. Or that is to say, Augustine would have said in the 4th century, until we find our full and final satisfaction in God himself, we will never find full and final satisfaction. 
But I just want to press in the text a little bit harder because Jesus doesn't necessarily say if anyone is thirsty for God. In fact, to be perfectly frank, thirsting for God seems a little too broad, almost generic in light of, especially in light of this gospel's Trinitarian focus. That is to say, rather than saying just God, John especially loves to speak in terms of Father, Son, and Spirit. So I don't want to be sort of imprecise and just throw out the general term God. If we can try to press the text for some, some precision. So here's, here's how we're going to do this. I'm, let's, let's just kind of look for some clues. And let's look first at the water that Jesus offers to see what kind of thirst we're looking for. Let's see what, uh, let's see what medicine, if you will, Jesus prescribes to see if we can sort of understand the disease. Let's see what sort of water it is so we can understand the thirst. Jesus says, verse 38, He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now the water Jesus offers turns into a spring of water. It's kind of an amazing word picture uh, if, if you can visualize it. Imagine taking a drink of water and uh, the water goes down your throat, into your belly. And once it's in your belly, the water doesn't just disappear. It starts growing. It starts expanding. And in fact, turns into a, a river that comes flowing out of you and and now everywhere you go, this water is splashing out in front of you. It's just like somebody turned on a fire hose in your navel. <laughs> it's just everywhere you point, water's coming out. I think it's meant to remind us of the rock that Moses struck. I think, I think there's some parallels here. Do you remember that? Here's this rock and there's water that keeps coming out of it. How does that happen? Oh, Moses hit it. God said, Moses hit the rock. Hit the rock, water comes out. God clearly did something inside that rock to make it a water factory, right? That's fair enough. You wouldn't necessarily think of rocks as water makers, but in this particular case, you couldn't think about the rock without thinking about the water that came out of it. In fact, you couldn't even probably get close to this rock without getting wet. In, in, in some sense, the water and the rock are inseparable because the water just keeps flowing and flowing. There's not a shutoff valve in it. So when you think of the rock, you think of the water. And as if you're an Israelite, you look at the water and where's the water come from? Well, it come from the rock. The Feast of Tabernacles was, among other things, the celebration of this particular water. The Jews lived in tents this week because they were commemorating their wilderness wanderings. And those wandering Hebrews out in the wilderness would have certainly died without some supernatural provision of food and water. I know how hard it is to keep five kids fed in the United States of America in 2017. Can you imagine keeping two, thousand, or two million Hebrews fed in the desert in... Uh, you know, 1500 B.C. Not an easy task. So, so they're commemorating God's goodness and giving them water from the rock. Uh, John, the commentator John Gill says this, and he quotes the Mishnah in here. He's, he's describing the Feast of Tabernacles. He says, uh, At which time there were great rejoicing, piping and dancing by the most religious and sober people among the Jews. I like that. The stodgiest old curmudgeon is out dancing his shoes off. Insomuch that it is said, and this is where he quotes the Mishnah, he that never saw the rejoicing of the place of drawing of water never saw any rejoicing in his life. And, and there, were, there was particular uh, celebration at this part of the feast where they would, they would take a golden cup and they would dip it in the pool of Siloam and bring it up to the temple and, and pour it out as a drink offering to God in remembrance of his provision of water for them. And, and first the water from the rock and then, uh, and of course, in more recent times in the form of rain that made their crops grow. And so I think that's really what Jesus is leveraging when he begins to speak about the water. 
Now in verse 39, John gives us, as we said, this sort of pry bar to open up the saying of Jesus. To help us interpret it. This he spoke of the Spirit. So the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is is the water. In other words, the, the Holy Spirit is what Jesus gives the thirsty to drink. The Spirit quenches the thirst, and then the Spirit flows out in this endless stream, like, like water came pouring out of the rock in the wilderness. So whatever thirst it is that Jesus is offering to quench, it's the Spirit that quenches it. And, and maybe we could narrow down our general sort of thirsting after God to thirsting for eternal life. Because there is an unmistakable connection in John's gospel with believing in Jesus and receiving eternal life, right? John 3.16, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Furthermore, Jesus tells Nicodemus in John 3, it is the spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. So we have not only a connection between Faith and life, we also understand that it's the Holy Spirit who gives life. John 4, we could look also at the the picture Jesus used there of living water becoming a spring of water, bubbling up to eternal life. That's what Jesus says there. We use the theological term regeneration to speak of the Holy Spirit's work of breathing new spiritual eternal life into a believer. There really is no, no such thing as salvation apart from the Holy Spirit giving life to a person, just as there is no salvation if the Father doesn't send the Son. There's no salvation if the Son doesn't die on the cross to atone for our sins. There is no salvation if the Holy Spirit does not quicken the heart to have faith in Christ. And while this is all true, I still don't think that's exactly what Jesus is driving at. There's two reasons I don't think we've hit it just yet. First reason comes in verse 39 where John says, This he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit, as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now I don't want to be confusing, but I'll try to make this at least understandable. Salvation has been since the fall of man by grace alone through faith alone. And regeneration has been by the Spirit of God alone. That is to say, in the same way that the Holy Spirit regenerates a man or a woman in 2017, that work of regeneration was also necessary in 2000 B.C. That is, if a gift of God... That is, if faith is a gift of God through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, now it was also prior to the cross. But John is speaking here of a specific ministry of the Spirit that was not to commence until the glorification of Jesus. You, You see that in verse 39. And Jesus was speaking of something that was, at the time he said it, a future reality. In other words, the the thirst-quenching ministry of the Spirit had not yet begun in the sense in which Jesus was speaking. I hope that makes sense to you. This, This ministry of the Spirit would commence with the glorification of Jesus. That is, in John's Gospel, it's that bundle of events that we call the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. So some new, some different ministry of the Spirit would begin with the glorification of Jesus that had never been seen before. Indeed, it couldn't have happened without Jesus' glorification. So that's clue number one. The second clue that we haven't quite nailed down yet is this. It comes from verse 38. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So wherever the Spirit goes into a man or woman, it also flows out. You see that? Drinking the water from Jesus isn't a one-way proposition. It's two ways, down and out. Not just down the hatch, it's down and out. It's drink water in, and mighty flowing rivers of water come out. And that doesn't quite seem to be a picture of regeneration either. Let me just comment on what Jesus says here concerning his use of the Old Testament. Quite often when someone 
in the New Testament says something like, as the Scripture says, they go on to quote a portion of the Old Testament text, or even perhaps closely paraphrase it. But here, it doesn't appear that Jesus is quoting any one text. He's just sort of summarizing uh, Old Testament truth that's drawn from multiple texts. Isaiah often uses, uh, uses water as this sort of word picture of God's blessing. Zechariah 14 has been suggested as being in the mind of Jesus. You have in Ezekiel this little trickle of water that just comes trickling out underneath the door of the temple, and then it gets bigger and bigger and deeper and deeper, and pretty soon there's people fishing in it. Fascinating picture of water and blessing connected with the, the wonder of the millennial kingdom. The prophet Joel speaks of the Spirit being poured out on all mankind. That's a water reference. But the, the themes in the Old Testament are common, and that is there's a day coming when God will bless His people in unusually great ways through the gift, not gifts, through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so we take these two clues. There's some ministry of the Spirit that's closely connected to this great work of Jesus that was not before the cross, but would be after it. And then we couple it with a picture of water flowing out of a person and just kind of work off of those two. We're going to take those two clues and try to, try to pin it down a little bit closer. So let's consider the nature of the Spirit's work in relationship to the cross. The first place in my mind that says, my mind says we need to look here is John 16. It's just a few pages ahead, so it won't hurt you too much to turn ahead to John 16 and verse 7. Here, Jesus says to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now we'll look at this text in greater detail when we get to chapter 16, maybe next year. But you can't help but notice right away that Jesus is here making a direct link between his ascension and a future ministry of the Spirit. A ministry that is rooted actually in Jesus sending the Spirit. So there's... There's, of course, a sense in which the Spirit is God, so He's everywhere. But there's another sense that Jesus is talking about here, in which the Spirit is sent by the crucified, risen, ascended Jesus in a way that He wasn't sent when there wasn't a crucified, risen, ascended Jesus there to send Him. Furthermore, isn't it particularly striking that Jesus says, it is is to your advantage that I go away. I think this is clear. If there's one thing I, I think is obvious, it is this. Jesus was more excited about sending the Holy Spirit than we are excited about him sending the Spirit. I've read this verse so many times and, and thought to myself so many times, are you kidding me? <laughs> I think I would rather have you here, Jesus. But Jesus is very excited about sending the Holy Spirit to us. He is standing in the temple shouting in John 7, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And here in John 16, he's telling his distraught disciples that they're going to be so much better off after he's gone because he's going to send the Spirit. And that's going to be far better for them. Here in John 16, when the Spirit comes, and you see this in verse 8, when the Spirit comes, He's going to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And I take that to mean He's going to do that through the work of the disciples, later the apostles, and the children of God in general. Maybe this is one way in which we could say the Spirit pours out of a believer. And that is to say, how does He convict the world? Well, He does so through the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, which is done by the people of God. There's, there's no separation between the the two, Paul makes that clear in Romans 10, that the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit and the common means of the grace of God through the preaching and sharing of the Word of God go hand in hand. But, but I don't think that mission of evangelism is quite the thirst quenching, uh, is qu I don't think that's quite the thirst Jesus is quenching in John 7. I don't think Jesus is saying, if you're thirsty to evangelize, I'm going to send the Spirit. 
I don't think that's, that's quite it. I'm not, sure if, I'm not sure Jesus is actually saying in John 7, if anyone's thirsty for the salvation of the world, let him come to me and drink. If you're thirsty for that, and, and you ought to be, by all means, go to Jesus. But I don't think that's what he's saying here. But it is clear from chapter 16 that Jesus is going to send the Spirit in a new way because of his glorification. The sending of the Spirit is not only going to replace Jesus' presence, which we understand from the phrase another comforter or another helper or counselor, however your translation translates the Greek word paraclete. But this, the Spirit is not only going to replace Jesus' presence, but it's, it's in fact going to, be very, it's going to be superior to it in a real and meaningful way. But it, it's, it's also clear from chapter 16 that Jesus is going to send the Spirit in this way because of his glorification when Jesus is glorified. Now the second piece of evidence that we're trying to work from is the, the river of water flowing out from a person. And we mentioned that that parallels the idea of a water-producing rock in the wilderness that we read about in Exodus Really, what is stranger than a water or a rock producing water? Uh, maybe you know that if you're in the desert and can't find water, you can hack open a cactus and maybe find something. We can. That's strange, sort of, but it's at least understandable. A cactus is a living thing and needs water. Finding water in some sort of organic material makes sense, but really, finding water in a rock. There's nothing deader and drier than a rock. You can't squeeze water out of rocks. It's, it's rather silly. But that's actually what God chose to use to demonstrate his power and his care for the Israelites. Let's think about it this way. If you're wandering in a field of rocks and you're really thirsty and that's all there is around you is rocks, you might be kind of disheartened. Unless you're an Israelite and you've drank water from a rock for a long time, you think, just think of the potential for water. Here, any of these rocks could be used by God to quench thirst. I'm going to skip the discussion on the punctuation. Um, and you can ask me about it later. But there is one other, there is one other thing that I want to ponder with you. Um, the ESV makes it real easy. Because we want to ask the question, okay, where's this water from? Uh, he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his... The New American Standard says, innermost being will flow rivers of living water. The ESV says heart. If you have Old King James, it has the word belly. It has the word belly. Now, typically, the, the word that uh, we translate heart is the Greek word cardia, from which we get our word cardiac. Uh, but here, Jesus uses a different word. It's the word, do you have it there? <laughs> Sounds like a spring. <laughs> the belly, the belly word, the heart word. <laughs> koilios, koilios, which almost always means a stomach. Uh, or if it's used in reference to a woman, it refers to the womb. It's, it's rooted in the Greek word koilos, which means hollow. And, and so... As, what in the world? From the innermost being, from the belly will come rivers of living water. Well, it's, it's natural, I think, that Jesus uses the word for stomach here because when you swallow something, that's where it goes. When you swallow something, it doesn't go into your heart. It goes into your stomach. Dietitians and really healthy people tell you everything goes straight to your heart, but not directly. I just eat what I like because I don't. food doesn't go to my heart. It goes to my stomach, so I got my organs straight. But in Jesus' day, people understood that the deepest feelings and longings and hungers, if you will, come from deep within them. They didn't necessarily distinguish between heart and mind or reason and emotion like we do. And Jesus says, uh, in, or Luke says in Luke 9.47 that Jesus knew what people were thinking in their heart. So their thinking is coming from, from here. And so, and so I think the ESV is very justified in using the English word heart to translate the Greek word stomach. There's not a confusion of organs here. Really what's being emphasized is that this water is coming out of the inner being. Uh, that is to say, it's from the heart of the matter. So let me take three texts to try to unravel this. 
and then I think we'll be buttoned up. First is Matthew 15, verse 17. We're just trying to nail down what this thirst is about and what this ministry of the Spirit is about. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. Well, thirsty for what? And what is this that we drink? And what is it that the Spirit comes out? In Matthew 15, beginning in verse 17, Jesus is talking to Peter and he says this, Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? Listen to this. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. Now here we have the simple principle that what is in the heart comes out. That's what we're taking notice of here. Murder comes out of a heart full of murder. Adultery and fornication come out of a heart that is full of wicked lust. Theft comes out of a heart that is full of greed and hatred and so on and so forth. Our second text will reinforce that, but with a twist, and that's Galatians 5. We're going to switch from the Gospels to Paul here. And listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 5, beginning in verse 19. We could go further back for some additional context, but we'll just start in verse 19, because it really reinforces what Jesus says in Matthew 5. Paul says this, The deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. These things are outside Actions and they come from, Jesus says, the heart. And those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you have a heart that is putting out these things, you will not, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So there's two kinds of hearts here. Here's the second one, beginning in verse 22. The first is the heart of the flesh that kicks out all this other stuff. The second, verse 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. So there's two kinds of hearts. One driven by The flesh, it's full of wickedness, it performs great wickedness. The other is full of the Spirit and performs great godliness. Love, joy, peace, etc. Wicked things come out of a wicked heart, but a Spirit-filled heart produces godly things. Now let me take you back once again to the book of Matthew in chapter 5. I'm going to put these three together and try to see if they fit on top of John 7. In Matthew 5, this is the Sermon on the Mount, verse 6, very familiar to you. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Now here Jesus is talking about a hunger and a thirst being satisfied. It it sounds rather similar to what Jesus says in John 7, but we have to ask ourselves, What does it mean to hunger for righteousness? Well, to hunger is to have some sort of a desire for something I don't possess. That is, you're not hungry for what you already ate. I think what Jesus is saying here is that he's he's saying, blessed are those who desire righteousness, even if they don't have it, because they will be satisfied. The next question we'd have to ask then is what satisfies them? And that's where I think we're getting to the heart of what Jesus is saying back in John 7. 
In John 7, I think that Jesus is not only speaking of the heart uh, that, that thirsts to be uh, regenerated, that thirsts for eternal life. It, it's it's uh, the Spirit. Uh, let me back up a, a little bit. Uh, it's not only the thirst. Jesus is not only talking about the thirst to be righteous uh, through faith in Christ. Uh, it's not just that the Spirit invades and regenerates and imputes righteousness to us. The Spirit does more than, than those things. Jesus is saying that not only do we take the Spirit in, but the Spirit then pours forth out of that heart that was formerly full of wickedness and evil desires. And now, and now the heart pours out the very thing that went in, which is godliness and holiness. It's the works of the Spirit. So without faith, it's impossible to please God. The Bible is very clear. But the implication of that is, by faith, it is possible to please God through what Paul calls in Ephesians 2.10, good works which he prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. There is no such thing as a godly life apart from the work of the Spirit of God. And Jesus knew that. Indeed, what separates genuine Christians from the world on a very practical, visible level is that the, the life of a genuine believer is characterized by a river of Spirit-saturated stuff pouring out from them. Because the Spirit is in the heart. And I think it's in this sense that the people of God post-cross are different from the people of God pre-cross. Here's what I mean. However the Spirit ministered to believers in, in, in old days, that's mostly a discussion for another time, but we do know that pre-cross, God, dis, God saw fit to distinguish His people, to set them apart by what we would consider to be sort of strange means. He gave them laws like, circumcise your sons. Uh, he gave them laws like, don't eat pork, and don't let centipedes crawl around on your oven, and don't yoke an ox and a donkey together, and for goodness sakes, don't wear mixed fabric clothing, and such the like. And everyone in the ancient world would have been easily able to identify an Israelite because they kept those laws. But the distinguishing mark of the people of God post-cross is not our diet, it's not the weird laws we keep. It's not circumcision. It is instead meant to be the obvious ministry of the Spirit of God that pours out of the heart of a believer in ways in which an unbeliever can never duplicate, particularly under the fires of persecution. So, those who hunger, those who thirst for a new life, a life that's no longer characterized by an endless river of thoughts and words and deeds that are displeasing to God and, and are wicked, those who hunger for a new heart out of which instead pours forth the blessed fruits of the Spirit, to that one, let that person come to Christ where the Spirit of God is freely given and is not only drank in, but pours out in such a way that it invades all aspects of life. So I would say to those who have a desire to be a righteous, godly spouse, or a righteous, godly parent, or a godly child, or even a righteous citizen, but above all, thirsty for righteousness and, and necessarily disgusted by the evil that lies in you, Go to Jesus and find there a fountain of life, the Spirit, from which to drink freely and fully. So, so I just ask, Christian, do you enjoy the ministry of the Spirit in you? Is it, is it even there? Can you see it? And can other people see it? Is there a sense in which you bathe everyone you come in contact with? You use that picture of the fire hose coming out of your belly button. Is there, a, is there a sense in which you bathe everyone that you come in contact with with the overflowing fruits of the Spirit? And of course, none of us do that perfectly, but all of us ought to. 
do we still thirst, not for something we don't have, but do we, as believers, thirst for more of what we do? Do we thirst for the Spirit to pour forth in fuller, deeper floods? We, we go to Jesus for that. We are saved by faith, yes, but we are sanctified not by the flesh. We are sanctified by the Spirit of God. The same fountain from which we drink our salvation, we will drink our sanctification. So don't stop drinking from this deep fountain of the Spirit and, and, and don't quench His heart-invading, heart-transforming and overflowing ministry. Jesus has been glorified and the Spirit has been sent. I hope that makes some sort of sense. I hope you can grab that. It's a lot of ground to cover. We'll stop there. And if you have questions, somebody else will answer them. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the fountain of the Holy Spirit that is ministered to us by the glorified Lord Jesus. Father, I pray that you would cause us all to have a deep thirst to drink deeply of the fountain that Jesus offers to us, not merely for eternal life, but, but to drink deeply so that out of our heart comes not the works of the flesh, but the works of the Spirit of God. And may these works mark us as your children. We pray that you would be gracious to do this for us. In Jesus' name, amen.